So let's go through that. You're chosen, holy, blameless, destined, sons and daughters of God, redeemed, and forgiven. That this is who we are, and scripture is riddled with these things, right? In Romans 8, it says that the Spirit cries out through us, I'm the Father, the Spirit bears witness that we are children of God, right? We're children of God. Psalm 139, right? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. John 8, 36, where the sun sets free is free indeed, right? So scripture is riddled with who we are. And so I feel like that's where the Father wants us to start, is to say, ground yourself, wake up, right? That's what the catechism is telling us, wake up, and then John Paul's telling us, because you have this great high call that you're warriors in this battle, and it might cost you something, not five dollars, your whole life, right? It might cost you your whole life. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ID London Live. This is the third time we're doing this. So third time's a charm. Maybe we'll do it right this time, right? I think everything went well the last two times. So welcome. Tonight we have a wonderful evening planned for you. We have uh, two guests on tonight, Jenny Zick and Rachel Herbeck, as well as my uh, co-host, Mariana, who I'll be introducing in a little bit. So tonight we're going to talk about the foundations of discipleship and we're going to share stories and have a Q&A period. So it's going to be wonderful. For those of you that don't know, um, ID London or London ID, um, usually we uh, it's a night we gather once a month, um, first Thursday of the month, and we listen to a live stream talk from ID National in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we usually we gather for mass at 615, then we have dinner at seven and the talk starts at eight. Um, but because of everything that's going on, things have switched up because of the, you know, this global pandemic and everything. So we are doing more things online now and we have started this, which is fun and we're having a blast. So we're going to keep doing it for now. And uh, so, yeah. Um, Pete Burak is the director of ID National, and ID is, it reaches out to people in their 20s and 30s, married, single, with or without children, student, working, everyone um, in that kind of age bracket. They found that the 20s to 30s, a lot of people were losing, maybe not losing their faith, but leaving the church and not, you know, um, getting in as invested in it. So they really created this to um, really drive home the faith and create intentional discipleship and intentional disciples out of this. So it's a wonderful night. I've been doing it for a little while now. I've been part of the core team for almost a year now and, or maybe more, I don't know, I've lost track of time, but it's it's a really great, great opportunity and it's a lot of fun. So um, just a few things before we get started. Um, if you're having a connection issue and you're watching us live on the webinar jam, um, there's a big reconnect button you can hit at the top and that should just fix all your problems. If you're watching on Facebook, it shouldn't be a problem. So you guys should just be totally fine. Um, and feel free to post questions in the chat at any time during the talk. If you have anything you want to ask me, you want to ask uh, Mariana, Rachel, or Jenny, um, just post them in the chat. If you want to post it anonymously, you can click the little button that says send to everybody, but instead just send it to admin and only then we can see the questions and we won't reveal your name or anything like that. If you have a question that you just don't want to know people, it came from you. It uh, came from you. Um, just to get into a little bit of what ID is, is uh, the four pillars of ID are initiate conversation, foster community, embrace orthodoxy, and arouse mission, which kind of is in our intro video there. So that's kind of what they do. They want to have conversations with people, just, you know, be a disciple, go talk to people. They want to create a community. There's lots of things we're doing to create like discipleship communities, and there's lots more going on behind the scenes that are going to be revealed to everyone in the future. Um, we're going to embrace orthodoxy. So we want to obey the teachings of the church and Jesus um, through scripture, tradition, and everything that the Catholic Church has to offer. And then mission. Of course, we want to go out and we want to help the world. Um, so those are the, the four pillars of what ID stands for. And it's what they want to do with this. And they've been doing it for a long time. And it's a truly wonderful. And I've been blessed by it in so many ways. Um, so to start the evening off, I'm going to invite uh, Mariana, my co-host, to come on with me. And 
Mariana, if she wants to join right now. Oh, there she is. Welcome, Mariana. Hi, David. Look at this. I'll even make you big so everyone can stare at you oh, instead of me. So this is Mariana. Welcome. She's a student you. at King's University. She loves spending time with her family and friends. Yes. And she's been part of the ID team for over a year. She does a lot of the planning for our mass and stuff. She's a great, great worker for that. And ID has, she's told me it's been such a blessing in her life. And I yes. believe it has. <laughs> So welcome, yes. Mariana. Thank you for the introduction. Glad to be here, David. <laughs> no problem. Okay, and next I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Jenny Zick. So Jenny Zick is our chapter coordinator for ID. She has a BA in theology and a concentration in pastoral ministry from the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University in St. Joseph, Minnesota. Um, she uh, has a Master in Arts and Theology. Um, she actually met her husband, David, great name, by the way, um, at an ID had an ID discipleship night, and she's had lots of years in campus at the University of Michigan, and she is becoming a spiritual director um, as we speak. So um, she does a lot of ministry. She loves sports, board games, and painting. And I actually got to meet Jenny um, just before COVID. I think we were talking about it. She came to Canada for one of our meetings, and we like it was just before they like shut the borders down. So it was truly great. So Jenny, are you there, Jenny? We'll see. See, I think she's there. Ah, I'm here. She is. Hello, Welcome, Jenny. Wow, really close up right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Back up a little bit. <laughs> there you go. So, welcome, Jenny. How are you doing? Doing great. You guys are always lovely to be with, so I'm pretty excited. Awesome. We're, We're excited. here too. So, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Mariana, do you want us to lead us in an opening prayer? Yes, please. So if everybody could join me in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eternal Father, we thank you and praise you for gathering us here together tonight. We ask that you help us to become like your son and to grow as his intentional disciples. Holy Spirit, we ask that you come, guide our conversation and all that we do. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. So just before I start asking Jenny questions, um, just to introduce her, I've gotten to know Jenny through um, video chats that we've had since, I think it was last September, right? Yeah. And yeah. On a monthly basis, and it's just been really wonderful. Jenny is such a wonderful person. I got to grow with her a lot, learn from her a lot about what it means to be an intentional disciple. So that's why I'm really looking forward to tonight and um, what Jenny has to share with us. So without further ado, I guess my first question for you would be, Jenny, is, um, um, you know, your role in Ann Arbor is chapter coordinator for the ID national team. So can you just tell us a little bit about what that means? Yeah, so I started with ID about a year ago, and um, so I'm a, one of the chapter coordinators. Rachel is another one of them, and so I am assigned to different chapters throughout the U.S. and Canada. So London is one of my chapters that I work with. So I've yes loved journeying with Mariana and discipleship and with Connie. Um, so basically, what my role is is I'm like the liaison between like the national office. And then our local chapters. And so um, I'm in we bi-weekly, um, bi-monthly conversation with the chapter leader. Um, so for London, which is Connie. Um, so I support her and talk with her and kind of see what's going on in the chapter, what's going on with the development of the team, how is the health of the team, as well as how's the health and organization of the disciples nights that happen. Um, once a month, as well as the discipleship communities or groups that London has as well. Um, and then ID is always full of a lot of great ideas. And so um, uh, Pete, our, the director, he's always just full of just great new thoughts. And so we always share like new initiatives and we've done a lot of um, brainstorming this year, but a lot of um, like program development for our chapters, which has been really exciting to be a part of just big movements within ID and the history of ID. Um, so that's been a joy. And then I, we often brainstorm different ideas, Connie and I together. And then, um, and then I try to do at least like two visits to the London chapter and to each chapter that I'm overseeing uh, per year. So 
as kind of like a general overview. Wonderful. And um, one question that I had for you is, I think some of our viewers might be curious as well, is how do you as a national team decide what your theme will be for certain disciples nights, what you're going to talk about or address? How does that go down? We actually had that conversation today, um, <laughs> of the fall of, okay, what are we, what are we going to do? What's on our hearts? Um, so a lot of it comes through like prayer and like what is going on in our world today? What are we hearing from um, young adults? What are we, and sometimes this comes to like, we don't ask like maybe direct questions to our chapters of like, what do you want us to talk about? Um, but it is kind of, it does come through like in those conversations of, oh, like this is something, this is an area that might be really helpful for us to tap into and to discuss further on Disciples Night. So I guess the long short of it is um, Holy Spirit. Like <laughs> we really do take a lot in prayer and what we receive, but we really do try to pay attention to like, what's going on like in our world today and how can we be a relevant voice um, to young adults. So yeah, great definitely. question. Very relevant for us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's awesome that you were already discussing that today. That just goes to show you. Um, yeah. So, also, how were you just initially introduced to ID before you started working for Rono Ministries and ID? How did how did that come about that you found out about ID? Yeah, so I moved to Ann Arbor um, almost four years ago, which is hard to imagine. But I moved four years ago not knowing a soul, um, like literally, I didn't know anyone, which was extremely terrifying. Um, and yeah, I knew the Lord was calling me here, even if I didn't understand why. Um, it was very clear in prayer and through scripture that the Lord was inviting me here. So I moved in. That's a whole different story. But the Lord placed me and led me to other Catholic women who were living in a household. And that was an immense gift. And I moved there. And one of them is like, hey, have you ever heard of ID? Probably like maybe. And I was like, no, I hadn't. I was just in Florida before then. I'm originally from Wisconsin. And she's like, well, you should come to the first Thursday of the month. They have a monthly gathering where young adults go for mass and conversation and dinner. And I was like, yes, like, please. <laughs> um, because I just, I was in Florida with my master's program through Notre Dame and I lived in an intentional faith community. And so community is huge for me. Uh, I recognized that in college and that's why I sought it out in grad school. Um, because that's where I know I thrive. I thrive in that kind of environment to be challenged and pushed by other people. And so when she said, hey, there's a gr big group of young adults I gather, I'm like, I'm all in. So um, so I went to the first month when I moved here. And then crazy enough, um, the second month, which David <laughs> pointed out, it's met when that's when I met my future husband, David. <laughs> um, so that's been a huge blessing, um, obviously, is to meet my mother mm -hmm. through ID. And then we went, I went a couple weeks later to the annual summit, which maybe some of you have been on before. Um, but that was huge, especially being new to the area and not knowing a lot of people, like being able to go on a retreat where you could make concrete relationships because you're together for you know 72 hours. So that was a huge blessing to a new person in the community um, to help start, flourish, and start, initiate some great relationships that I still have today. Um, and the last thing I think was very initially introduced was ID has discipleship groups, which I mentioned before. And so I was in a women's group and I've been in it for, I think, two to three years and it's been a huge blessing in my life. Wonderful. Um, one question that I have about that is um, what did the women's group that you were a part of do for you? Because I know that we have one here in London. Um, so what did like that growth from that, like how did that help you? I love my women's group. They're just like gems. Um, just so blessed. They yeah, we all start. This is kind of the story, I guess. The theme of my uh, women's group was um, we all started single. And I don't even know if anyone was even dating, like at that point, maybe like a few people. Um, 
and that wasn't necessarily the point, obviously, of women's group. Like these are like extremely like faithful women, women that love the Lord, women that want to serve God, who want to just pursue virtue and goodness and to root out sin in their life. And so just such a blessing to journey with people and to be held accountable and to have those people I can go to regularly to really do a deep dive into faith and discuss deep questions of our faith. And a byproduct, you know, of my women's group is all of us have found our vocation in it, which is crazy. I'm like, wow, out of six or seven or eight of us that have been in the group, we have had one enter religious life. Wow. And then we had everyone else has entered um, married life on the spouse. Some are still like engaged, but moving obviously towards marriage and some now have babies. I mean, it's just crazy to think wow. that and, like, if you want to get married or want to go to religious life or find that confirmation that you're supposed to be single, like come in this group because <laughs> <laughs> barely everyone finds it. So it's been an incredible blessing in my life. That is so awesome. Yeah. And I think too, um, with our chapter, because there's so many people that are coming from university and they're just kind of landing into mm -hmm. London. Um, what you're saying about making those connections, like you said, when you don't know anybody, that this is something that you can go to and turn to, to find that community, the support, like you said, other people who are running towards the Lord that like we can right. go like together. It's not just something we do on our own. That's really wonderful. Yeah. And so yeah. also, how did you make the transition from, just being an ID to then, you know, discerning this idea of actually working for ID. Yeah. Um, the Lord has, you know, beautiful plans for all of us. And so I, the year before I started, um, well, actually maybe six months before I started uh, working for ID, the Lord just like deeply placed on my heart, this like restlessness in my current position. And, um, yeah, there's just like a lot of restlessness in my heart. And then the Lord just really like opened the door um, to me, even talking with Caitlin, who used to work with ID. Um, we had those initial conversations. The timing of that was like impeccable by God. But I think the thing that really attracted me to ID was its pursuit of how to do ministry and discipleship. Mm -hmm. um, I've always want like I've worked in the church for for years um but really hadn't found a parish that really under like to really live mission and ministry in your work uh, which seems obvious and like yeah of course like people who work for the church are going to go to mass every day going to go into adoration every every day or prayer regularly but that actually wasn't my experience before id and that was a struggle of mine i was like frustrated I was like why isn't this like supported why aren't the sacraments or prayer or why isn't jesus the center of everything i kind of saw a lot of people like relying on themselves um rather than on jesus being our leader and guide and he's the one like that we go to he's the one that has all these ideas and plans and we just, he wants us to listen and to follow, um, not to follow our own will or own plan, but his plan. And I knew Pete and the whole team had that heart. And that was so attractive to me. Like, this is how I want to do ministry is to do ministry where Jesus is the center, the focal point of everything that we do. The word of mm -hmm. God is center, you know, um, mass and all of that, like the pursuit of holiness is so tangible, like within our team, because like we're all just running, like we're running to be saints and we want to be saints and we want everyone to be saints. And so it was just extremely refreshing to be in that environment that wanted the same thing that I did and mm -hmm. wanted to do ministry in the same way that my heart's always wanted to. That's beautiful because I think too, when I look at even just in general, the fruits of ID, that it's like so well known that it's in so many chapters. I mean, it's just, and even in our own lives, like, I mean, David and I can speak to this, but the fruits of it in our own lives, like I can see what you're saying about being a part of that in such a tangible way on a national level. Like, it's just a beautiful mm -hmm. thing, like the way that ID is so national. Yeah. Do you have any questions for Jenny, David? Yeah, actually, um, when you were talking there, you mentioned that like community is such a big part of like who you are and how you challenge it. So my question is like during 
this time of COVID and like social distancing and everything, like how has that affected you and how have you like overcome or has it done anything? Oh like man. That? How have I yeah, fallen on my how face? Have you um, the waters in this? <laughs> yeah, I love people. I, I love being around other people. I'm not a huge extrovert, but I am extroverted and I just yeah, thrive on being with others. So this time has actually been super challenging to find um, because I am also a very in-person person. person. Um, Like I love phone calls and definitely have been on the phone with many friends and all that, but it's just different um, not being in each other's presence. And so I definitely, that was, that was hard and that was pretty rough. Um, So I don't know that I didn't have really like a great answer, but I just think keeping up with um, those friends even if it had to be over the phone, like that's just what it was. And so we just made it work and did it. And that was very sustaining for me. And then also maybe this is kind of a gem, kind of like an epiphany moment, even though I should have thought of it way long ago. (laughs) Um, Was my spiritual director, I was going through something kind of challenging um, during COVID. She's like, have you had like people just pray over you? And I was like, no, but like, why haven't I? <laughs> so I asked a few friends, one over the phone, and then now, at least here in Ann Arbor, things are getting better. And so we were outside together, and I just asked both those friends, like, can you just pray over me? And that was like a huge cloud just lifted. And so that I think was kind of a moving point, a changing point for me um, of embracing community, engaging with community, even if it is virtual, but also still engaging in prayer and also praying over each other to call upon the Holy Spirit to fall fresh. So I guess that's my answer. I didn't do well, but I tried. (laughs) (laughs) So then leading off that, um, has this time opened your eyes to anything that you see that we should be doing differently in our day-to-day lives when we go Mm -hmm. back to like, the normal way, like whatever normal is going to be. Like, I know it's different for you guys mm-hmm. for us here in Canada, but like, has like, you learned anything? Like, I know we've learned lots of like, you know, you have to reach out to people differently and stuff like that. So what have you learned or what has God said to you in this time that we should take on and continue on for the rest of our lives? Because, you know, this pandemic has changed so much. Right. I think one of the biggest things for me, which I'm sure many people can relate to, is busyness. Um, I think that that I I can't tell you like how many times I've had conversations before COVID of I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, and it becomes this excuse of I can't I can't even pray anymore because I'm so busy. I can't take ten minutes for my day to day just to, just to pray. And so I think, I think the enemy honestly was like winning a lot of our hearts and our lives by this endless pursuit of having our schedule so full. And so I feel like the Lord just really was like reminding us of like, this is like your life is about like communion with him and not like having this and this, I can get easily just like so tempted into filling my schedule But this has really said like, no, like slowing down, like really prioritizing God in my life and making opportunities for really like, thank you, Lord, for the people in my life. And thank you for placing them in my life and really not taking others for granted. Um, But then another thing that I'm kind of passionate about, which kind of relates to the busyness thing, is I think that our, our world was like pride, even like Christians, we're priding around breaking the third commandment of like, yeah, like I got so many things to do and I got this to get done. And like Sabbath is kind of like an out the window, like out the door, like no Sundays have become a day of like sports or it has become a day of chores or tasks. And so we've kind of lost the beauty of being able to rest. We've lost the beauty of being able to have the Sabbath be Sabbath because we need it. Like God of all wisdom knows that we need rest and we need time in prayer. We need time for our families. We need time for our friends. We need time to enjoy those things that bring us life and energy. Um, So that's, I guess that is a theme for me is just being content with saying no more 
in order to say yes more fully to God and others. That's a, a great answer. That's mm-hmm. definitely something I can see is that like, it's almost easier to keep the, the Sabbath holy because we have so much time to do things, right? Like it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely very different. And we are actually in Canada, we have just started to reopen mass again. So it's, it's nice that way that we're going to be able to go back and celebrate and receive the body and blood of Jesus. So it's, it's very different that way, but um, we are going to get moving on here. So I'm going to introduce Rachel, Rachel Herbeck, who is coming on with us. Um, she is another chapter coordinator with ID. Um, she has a BA in Catholic studies from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, she's worked in youth ministry and she does speakers and retreats and conferences all across the continent. I like to say that because she came to Canada and she did our summit last year. So. Um, yeah, she's really great. And there she is. Hello, Rachel. She's worked in many pro-life and political organizations. She's lobbied on behalf of the Catholic bishops of Minnesota, and uh, she likes cooking and preaching in her spare time. So welcome, Rachel, to the show. How are you today? Hey, you guys. How, can you hear how's volume, everything? It's like after doing doing so many things on Zoom, I'm like, we got to do the check and just make sure. You're, you're sounding good. We can hear you. Everything will work when you don't need it to, and then it will not work when you need it to. So I'm glad we're working up and running. Um, Thank you guys so much for having me on. I'm excited. Jenny and I were talking, I think it was yesterday, and we were like talking about you guys as a chapter. And like, ever since I came, I feel like I got to know you guys at the summit, the Toronto summit, or the London summit. And you guys are just fun. You're fiery. Like, I feel like I always have energy when I'm around you guys. Like, you're just so fun to be with. So shout out to everyone that I can't see. Comment in the chat. I like to see a little bit of activity. So I'm ex- I'm tired and now I feel like I'm ready to go because you guys always give me some life. You would you would have got energized for an intro video because it's actually you talking over it from our summit. Wow. Like I love energizing video. myself. Oh yeah. You would be like I'm pumped up every time I hear it. It's like a minute long and it's like, okay, I'm ready to do this. <laughs> just yelling, just straight yelling. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so gosh. Rachel, how did you first get involved with ID? Yeah, I have a a pretty unique perspective, I think, because um, it kind of like came out of a group of people that I knew very well. And then also I was I was involved in kind of the the beginning stages of it, not even as a young adult. So I do kind of came to be when I first when I was a senior in high school. So I was born and raised here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where it kind of happened and it it happened as an outgrowth of renewal ministries. which is an organization that I grew up in, you know, having my parents, you know, my dad is the vice president there. And um, so I was just kind of like familiar with what was going on. And for me, I was on the tails of just a very kind of intense, fiery conversion. You know, at the end of my junior year of high school, the Lord had really grabbed me in a very serious way. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so it was like, you know, you're just in that tunnel of just like fire and of excitement. And every day you wake up, with a new zeal for Jesus. And so I was, I think I was probably 16. And um, there were a number of young adults, including Pete Brock, our director, um, who is a very good friend of our family, very good. He and my brother are the same age. And he had been walking with my dad for a while and really feeling the sense that the Lord wanted to do something with young adults because the age group that ID now exists for just didn't exist. And so they got a group of like young adults in their twenties together to go up to like a nice little cottage up North here, Michigan, Michiganders love going up North to the lake. And so we went to like this sweet house and, um, I, I knew a lot of the people from the different camps that we did and had gone on mission trips with them. And so it was a great group of young adults. And then me and a couple of friends, we were like 16 and 17, you know, just like tagged along. And now looking back, the young adults were like so gracious. It's like, how annoying, you know, to have like these 16 year olds on the trip. But I just remember like, I, I was again, like in this place of just like fire and I remember just being on this retreat with these people who were just so zealous for the Lord. And like, that's one thing I can say of like my initial coming together was like that first weekend where that the name of ID came out of that weekend um, was actually come up with by a sister who's now um, in the convent in Minnesota. Um, right. Sister um, Maria Faustina is now her name and she is amazing. And she had a dream about the name and um that ended up being our name and just everything about that weekend was smooth and it was anointed and the worship was anointed and it was just like 
from the beginning, it was just so simple and it was so clearly open to and led by the spirit. And I remember just like coming off that, like on fire and being like, I can't wait to be involved in this. And then throughout my senior year, like we were kind of, the initial setup was kind of like a ragtag team. And I would go and our first disciples nights for a long time were in a middle school gym. Like it was, a, it was a setup in a middle school gym with like Domino's pizza and like everyone was loving it. But it just, it was, that you could tell, even as a 16 year old, I could tell the stuff of what was happening was very just like of the Lord, you know? So that was like my first encounter when I was, a, and I'm young for my grade. So I was a senior, I was 16, 17. And then I went off to college and had to kind of, wasn't as involved, but I just remember like it really being with the young and also our first involved in ID really kind of set me on fire, reset me on fire. Nice. And right now, what is the Lord saying to you and what do you want to share with us in this whole experience? Yeah. Um, I can't believe we've been in quarantine for three months. It's just like, it's, it's a little crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and I feel like I've been going back and forth with the Lord. Like, it feels like some days in this quarantine, like the Lord can't say enough and I can't write fast enough in what he's saying. And then some days you wake up and you're like, am I even a, like a spiritual person? Like, have I ever like talked to God before? Like, I don't know if anyone else relates. Maybe it's just like the, um, it's the, my friend and I, we've been saying like during the beginning of quarantine, we realized like how much we were saying and how much we heard other people saying like the phrase in these times it would be like in these unprecedented times. So we, we started saying in the queue instead of in quarantine. So, so when we were in the queue, you guys can steal that if you want. Um, we love it. <laughs> so like in those days in the queue, you just, there's just this underlying sense of like fatigue, spiritual fatigue. And so there are some days where I feel like the Lord is speaking to me, but those are, are few and far between. And then there's other days where everything kind of feels um, like a battle. So there's kind of twofold things that the Lord has been speaking to me um and it's it's really evolved over the course of quarantine and over the beginning i, I caught the end of you know what jenny was saying about sabbath and rest and an, an unhurried pace of life and the lord really getting us off the treadmill and i think i've definitely the lord definitely was speaking that to me over the last couple months um pretty recently the lord has had two pretty strong words the first one um from two different scripture passages and I was only going to share one, but I'm going to share both um, just because I feel like the Lord convicting me, but just with everything that was going on, you know, you had COVID and then now you have, you know, the, the, in the, in the United States, at least all of this stuff going on with, with racism and the protests and then the protests leading to the riots and just so, so much unrest and clearly the devil like playing his hand in a sense, you know, like he has lit the match for so many things happening and, um, I was up, I've, I haven't been sleeping very well during quarantine. And one of the things that the Lord started speaking to me kind of during all of, you know, this new phase of quarantine, which is kind of all this violence around the United States and all this, the, the, you know, the sin of racism really showing, showing its head. And I was up around three, four o'clock in the morning, just like praying, um, probably about two weeks ago now. And I just really felt the Lord, um, I was praying like, you know, Jesus, like, stop all of this stuff, you know, that's going on. And I was like, Lord, is this like the end of the world? You know, I was like, seriously, though, can you like let me in? Like, is this end times? Because between like the murder hornets that they're finding in the US and, you know, all these different things, it kind of feels like something's um, happening. But I just thought the Lord like really gently asked me this question. It was like in prayer, he turned to me and he just said, are you desperate? Are you desperate yet? And, you know, I came out of the gate strong with my answer. I was like, yeah, like, of course I'm desperate. Like, I'm desperate. Like, I'm, I'm sick of myself. I'm sick of how the world is. Like, I'm desperate for change. I'm desperate to be holy. All of a sudden, he was like, that's not, like, I do want you to be desperate for that. But that's not necessarily what I mean. Like, he's like, in a purified way, are you desperate to see me again? Like, not are you, not are you desperate for the effects of what, I do for you, right? That, that I make you whole, that I make you holy, that I purify you. But are you desperate to see me face to face? And this is something that the Lord's really just been like impressing upon me in the last few weeks is just um, 
that as, as Christians, right, we're called to have um, a prophetic witness to the world, right? But so often we get caught up in our own lives and I get caught up in what's going on like right here. And so I think about the fact that Jesus came and I live in the fact that Jesus came and I even live in the power of the Holy Spirit. But he's like, you are forgetting, right? You're not living with the future anticipation and a, and a good expectation over the fact that I'm going to come again, right? That we're living between the two advents of Jesus, that we're living um, like in the not yet. We're living in the already because Jesus has already come once and then we're living in the not yet. And this is a big chunk of hope then that we're, we're missing out on and we're missing out on giving other people. And it was like the Lord was just like convicting me and he was saying, look, like the, the whole world is insanely desperate. Like look around, everybody is desperate, right? The world is out like it's what's said, you know, they're desperate, they're grasping at everything. And I want, I'm looking for my people to be desperate for me, to be desperate to see me again. And I um, I was I read this passage from Daniel. I'm gonna try to find Daniel in my Bible quick. Um, anyone know where Daniel is? I mean, obviously in the Old Testament, but um, the four Psalms. But I was reading this passage in Daniel. Let me find it. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna look it up on my computer because. Um, <laughs> have the internet and Google, and it's a wonderful device. I know, right? Um, but Daniel has this dream, right, where he uh, he has this infamous dream. I mean, Daniel's most famous for the lion's den, but but Daniel has this dream that's kind of like, it's about the end times, and it's kind of complex. And, and the Lord just, would, just brought me to this part of Daniel chapter 7. I want to read a little bit of it and kind of see what it does in us. So I'll tell you where I'm going to start. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start at um, verse 9. So Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And I just want you to, to kind of think about what, like, Jesus is stirring in your heart as you kind of hear some of this. And so Daniel's describing, like, when Jesus comes again, essentially. Um, Daniel says, this is his vision. He says, I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming from before him, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the, approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given all glory and all sovereign power and all nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And like when I read that, like it's hard for me not to cry. Like it's hard for like I get goosebumps all over my body. And I just feel like the Lord is like wanting us to look forward. Like this description of like Jesus, like an integral part of Christianity is not just that like we're going to get to go to heaven, which is amazing in and of itself, but that what Jesus has promised is that he's going to come again. And part of that is he's going to bring heaven to earth. Mm -hmm. What it says in the book of, of Revelation is I'm going to wipe every tear from every eye and I'm going to bring perfect justice, perfect vengeance. I'm going to make everything new. And, and everything that we're suffering for, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight for justice. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight to bring heaven to earth now. We should. But in the times that we're living in, living in so many of us have lost our salt because we don't desire what Daniel describes. Like when we wake up and are moving in hope, moving in Christianity, like does my heart yearn and is desperate for to see the face of Jesus? Or Jesus that is going to come and he's going to walk our streets and all of the injustices, the blood that cries out for justice from the ground. He's going to come and make everything right. Right. And that's what we get to communicate to people. But we usually don't, you know, so like we usually don't do that. You know, like, I mean, I don't go walking around being like, God is going to bring you vengeance, you know, because that freaks people out. But, but like this 
for us, I feel, for me, the Lord was just like, I want to stir that up in you, like a desperation, not for you to just be better, not for you to become holier so you can enter into heaven, but like, I want to stir up in you a desperation to see my face. And everything else is an addition. Everything else is a plus to the great, great, great reward, which is to, right, to see the Ancient of Days coming down on the clouds of heaven, seated on the throne with, how does that describe it? Thousands and tens of thousands around him, every knee, every nation, every tongue. That's the great longing, the great hope, and the great desire of a Christian, right? And we lose taste, we lose salt. I lose taste and salt in my not the bearer of justice, but I know who can, or I know who's going to wipe every tear away from your eyes. So that was a little, honestly, I was going to go into something else. And then as I started talking, the Lord was like, no, no, do this. Um, and so just like that of like, how am I being salt and light? But how is that informed by the hope I have in Jesus. And that's part of actually some of what I originally was going to talk about was in Galatians chapter three. And it talks about how we've been born, like literally we've been born into the faith of Abraham. And, and Galatians chapter three says that through Abraham's faith, we are children of God and children of Abraham. And through the anointed one, Jesus, we have been immersed into his faith. We have been immersed into his anointing. And because of that, we have access to the very promises of the kingdom of God. You know, which kind of go, goes along with, right, the second coming of Jesus, that there's so many things that we have access to as Catholics that we don't tap into, right? And so it's like we have this forward-looking vision of what we have to offer to everyone is come into our family, come join our family. We want you in our family. And you actually don't have to, you have to repent and believe to be a part of our family. You get baptized and then Jesus takes your place. He breaks the curse over your life and he gives you a new destiny, which is that now you don't have to be afraid for him to come again. We can walk in hope for him to come again because we know what he's going to do when he comes on the clouds, right? And I know that when he comes again, he's going to give me my inheritance, which is the same inheritance that he gets from God the Father, which is just like insane, you know? Like it's just like crazy, right? Um, and so it all like, it all goes together. And so for us to be able to, t we need to tap into this ourselves because our true job is to give it away to the world and we can't give it away unless we're truly living in it. Oh, it is. Oh my gosh. That is so <laughs> I'm just like, we're on fire now. That is amazing. But like what they're saying though is like, I love it because Daniel 7 is great because it's that being eternity minded and thinking mm -hmm. about like, and like you said too, like this second coming, we have to be ready for it because only the father knows, not even the son. Yeah. And so like being prepared and ready for that. And we even pray that in the, our father, right? Thy mm -hmm. kingdom come, thy will be done. We want it right. to come. Like Paul anticipated this, Peter anticipated, they wanted it. So you're right that like, yes, we need to be reminded of this. Thank you. That is just like- 100%, okay. yeah. And when I think of it, I'm like, wait, no, like I want that, but like, not yet, because like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> like, yeah, like, like, that sounds cool, but just like later, you know, because I still got to do a lot of stuff. Like, I got to get married and I got to <laughs> get some more money, you know, like all these different things. But like that, that, yeah, that eternity mindset. And also of like the Lord's been convicting me of like remembering, like, yeah, like the son doesn't even know. And so remembering the character of the father, right? That he's a good father. And, and St. Paul says, says of God that he desires that all men are saved. That doesn't mean that all men will be saved, but that's God's desire, you know, that he's not trying to trap us into going to hell. Like, oh, whoops, like you had a blind spot that you didn't see and I came again when you weren't looking and now you're in hell. You know, like that's not God, right? That's not the character of God. And so I think when I think of the second coming, I often have fear um, that leads to anxiety. And if you have fear of the Lord is proper fear, which leads to right action, but fear that leads to anxiety is not of the Lord. And so 
to also start thinking of the second coming, not just as Jesus is going to come as a judge, which he will, but also like that I've been walking with this man on earth and like I get to like see him. You know, it's like online dating to the max, right? Like that's, it's like, that's a horrible example, but it's like those 90 day fiance things, you know, where they like are talking in another country and they never met. Is that on like Sarah rides? I can't imagine that scenario, but like, but that like, yes, like I need to be ready, but also of like, I can be confident that if I'm living as a disciple and I'm rooting out sin in my life and I'm doing everything that I can, that I can have an excitement because like I get to see Jesus. Like how many Christians like are actually waking up excited being like, you know, like sure, like the I could like have the rapture happen because I'm excited to see Jesus face to face. Like I'm preaching to myself because I know I'm not like that. You know, I'm like, just give me like 50 more years and then you can go. <laughs> Do you have any like advice though of how to do that practically? So, you know, like sure. being you know, like realizing that he's like a- anticipating his coming like always, every day. Like how do we mm-hmm. do that out in a very practical way, I guess? Right. Um I feel like I sound like a broken record, but um a big, big thing, and this might be like so general to some people, but a huge thing that in quarantine actually has has shifted my mind my mindset so much, and I actually notice it like on a day to day difference is being like not just reading like one scripture verse or even like the readings of a day, but like being entrenched in the Word of God like as my food. I mean, everything that Jesus even says in the Gospels points to the Father, right? Which points to eternity. Like if you read the like the Gospels in detail, like Jesus is rarely ever is just talking about like the here and now. And so being um, being acquainted with Jesus means being acquainted with an eternal mindset, right? And to be ignorant of scriptures, to be ignorant of Christ. And so to really like, especially during this time we've been separated from the Eucharist, the catechism actually talks about the Eucharist and scripture as our two sources of food, right? That scripture and the Eucharist feed us, right? That this book, like even if I, a preacher that I love, he says like, um, people always say like, oh, I don't remember what I read. But like, even if I read scripture and then I go back and I don't remember, like it still fed me. Like, I don't remember what I ate last week, but it still nourished me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the more like, the more we read scripture and if you're kind of looking for a place to start, I would suggest looking in, the, uh, starting in the gospel of John. Um, and that's a, that's a really good place to start because the more acquainted you are with the words of scripture, which are the words of, of the spirit written to you and for you, um, which is the exposition of the scripture is the exposition of the mind of God, right? And the mind of God can only be eternal and is only eternally focused. And so the more that I read, the more that my mind and my thoughts um, become acquainted um, with the mind of Jesus and become formed to the mind of God. And as a second thing I would say along with that um, is something really practical for me is to, um, take all of my thoughts captive and ones that aren't eternally focused and ones that are not in alliance with scripture and the character of God to submit those to Christ so he can defeat them. And so I get them out of my mind. So like a practice, it's what it's like Paul talking about the renewal of your mind, right? He says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So as we renew our minds, that's how we become transformed into citizens of heaven. Right. And so, um, so to take, I take thoughts captive that like I make a pact with myself in the morning. I fail very often, but like thoughts that God would not think do not get to come between my ears. And if they do, then I take them captive and I get in this book and I replace those thoughts with, with an eternally focused thought. Um, and then it begins to press. So your mind will start to renew and you'll start kind of thinking, having a new way of thinking. Beautiful. I love that advice. That is wonderful. That is. We are going to get some questions from our chat. And we're going to invite Jenny back. So come on back. Oh, hello. Hello. So we have a question here first from Nathan. Um, so it says, sometimes I find worship music so uplifting and inspirational. And yet in my own personal prayer, I have a hard time keeping God present. Any thoughts on how I can be truly immersed myself in prayer? So I don't know, Rachel or Jenny, whoever wants to take this one, go for it. Um, Something that's helped me is like sitting um, with my eyes closed and just imagining Jesus' face and looking at me. Um, That often can like calm me and like a lot of times in prayer, I can remind you of the Um, 
would sort of sit in the presence of the Lord and allow him to do with the pun. Um, he was upon him, obviously, he was a God, he was a lot. Um, so this, I don't know, that has helped to calm me and to center me um, before prayer. But something I also like to do with the scripture um, is something that helps me mentally is like placing myself in the scene. Um, I can often like just focus my mind into by like literally I'm reading out loud or I'm reading it in my head but then sitting and pausing and like allowing myself to enter into that scene, into that place and allow Jesus to speak to me there. You know, cause a lot of times I'm either one of the people in the story or something, um, you know, just really like grabs me and stands out to me, but that can just keep me from not being so like distracted. Um, it's just really having Jesus show me and open up my soul of what he needs to say, share with me like that day in particular, um, of which the soul can really, of which that story can really speak and feed my soul. Those are the two things that I thought of that helped me. Nice. Anything to add, Rachel? Or? I'm muted. I always keep talking when I'm muted. Um, no, I would agree with those things. I definitely relate to that. Like I, um, like even today, like I had this thing where I was sitting outside and I was praying and I was like, I'm just going to listen to a worship song to like start. But then I was like going on Spotify on my phone, like for like 15 minutes. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like I was getting so distracted by like finding the songs. Then like someone would text me and be like, okay, I got to do this text really quick and like go back to Spotify. Um, and I love like a good worship song, but the Lord has, has just been convicted to me. Like does the thought of like not having like worship or using that as prayer like um while I'm reading scripture while I'm journaling and sitting down with the Lord like does that give me like any sense of discomfort that I'm like nervous about being in silence and solitude and for me if I am that probably means that I need to be in silence and solitude um and so worship music is amazing and I love it like I go off to it in my car um so often but I think like if we're finding that it's a crutch and we're not spending like equal amount of time in worship as we are in silence um then like stop, start more to lean into the hard work of just being in silence and not doing anything. Very nice. Okay, we have another question here. Um, so both of you spoke about the fire within. Um, and can you elaborate on how does one fan the flame into the fire? And is, is it if it's something that someone desires? So how do you fan the flame of the Holy Spirit, so it is a burning fire inside of you, basically. So I don't know if uh, you want to start with one, Jenny or Rachel, whoever wants to take her first, go for it. Yeah. I think it kind of, it depends, I would say. My answer varies a little bit depending on where you're starting from. If you're new into a relationship with the Holy Spirit and you're saying, I want that fire, um, ask for it. You have it. You actually have it in you already. It's just not whittled, like you know, like a how the the match just isn't struck yet on the gasoline. So you have it in you, like that fire that you wanted already exists in you. So if you're at that stage where you're like, I'm hearing about that, and I don't feel like I have that. I don't feel like I've ever had that. The Lord really wants to give it to you, right? So ask really simply, like in whatever words you want, you know. Um, Lord, give me that that fire um, in a particular way. Um, you know, when, when the Holy Spirit ignites that fire inside of you, one thing that I've been thinking and praying of during quarantine, how to keep that fire stoked, um, is to not like, like if you think of it in like an oven, like the, the desert fathers talk about this, of how important it is, like as you're tending a fire, like if a fire is in an enclosed, an enclosed space, not to open the door to the furnace too often, right? To be very discerning about when you open the door to the fire. Um, and for me particularly, this is like for when I speak, I tend to open my mouth unnecessarily, um, all the time, but like, but just, just saying during this time, particularly in quarantine, and I think what some of what, what Jenny was saying, and especially talking about time with God is that alone time and like, like being in an amazing prayer meeting can really soak that fire, doing all these things. But, but what stokes the fire more than anything is getting alone in secret. You know, like Matthew says, with your door closed in, in the quiet place, um, is being in secret with Jesus and letting him stoke that fire whatever way he wants to. And then being very guarding 
of that fire, being very zealous for that fire, that not anybody gets to open that door to that fire, to that secret place that you've cultivated. So what is like, what is your interior life? Like Jesus had to reprimand me at one point in my life because he was like, why are you sharing with everybody what I meant for us? You know, like there was a piece of the fire that I wasn't guarding, you know, that I was opening the door so much. And he's like, why are you putting the fire out? Like literally, I just started this, you're putting the fire out. <laughs> so, but like there, of, of discerning what is, what is interior that co- becomes exterior and what is interior forever. And that those things that are interior forever with the Lord are, are special. And those are the logs that, that stay burning. And so I think, um, One, ask for more of the Holy Spirit, and two, like, be very guarding of the fire and how you open the furnace to the fire and what you let in. Good answer, good answer. Anything you want to add to that, Jenny? Yeah, I love talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm just like, yes. Oh, man. Let's say more. Uh, Oh, gosh. Yeah, Holy Spirit is just the bomb. Um, Yeah, I agree totally with Rachel of just that simple invitation just like come Holy Spirit, like come more, like captivate my heart, like take control, take over. You know, I just, I'm, yeah, I'm desperate for you. Like just come, like I allow you, I give you permission to come over me, to come in me. Um, I think a big thing is letting go, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, we try to control so much like in our life and control situations or conversations, but I think this year is like Holy Spirit really want allow like wanting and inviting us to allow Him to take control. <laughs> Those times I'm like calm Holy Spirit, like calm all breath upon me. Honestly, it's like it's letting go and allowing the Lord to move, allowing mm-hmm. Holy Spirit to take over your words, to take over what you do, um, which is so exciting because it always brings life. Like that is. Mm-hmm. Is he bring life, and that's what he wants to do in us. Bring us life by bringing us life. We bring other people life. We bring it, other people the Holy Spirit. Um, so I don't know. A couple of things for me is like prayer, essential to like call upon the Holy Spirit to practice it, like to have that intimate, like Rachel's doing, intimate interior like relationship with the Spirit. But then also to be able to have those opportunities, those avenues to exercise the Holy Spirit with others. So like prayer is huge. To be able to pray over other people, to be able to pray with other people out loud and invoke the Holy Spirit and just like the Holy Spirit is going to move. He's like move your heart, their heart. Um, so that's like where I see the Holy Spirit really take over. And um, like very tangible. Like you can just sense like very strongly the presence of the Holy Spirit in prayer with each other. And then the other thing I think is just even the prompting, like once you engage and um, learn like more of the Holy Spirit and speak to the Spirit, you know, as a, a friendship, you're growing in friendship, um, you're going to notice just different like promptings like in your life, or, like go here, like speak to this person, do this. And the more that you're obedient, the more the person going to ask you to do more. And mm-hmm. so that's also extremely life-giving. So a lot of those things I'm like, I don't want to do. Like, <laughs> I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, but obviously, every time you do engage with it, it's, again, very life-giving for yourself, but mm-hmm. also for the people that you're with. Um, so those are just, yeah, a few things. I, yeah, I could go on, but... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, those, are, those are some great suggestions. Yeah, really okay. good. We have one last question from Nathan Hare. So how can we welcome Jesus back into our souls for the first time since the pandemic restrictions? So um, we are opening mass this week. Actually, yesterday, they just opened up. So how are we going to welcome back in any prayer or disposition that Rachel would suggest? So this one's directed at you, Rachel. Um, yeah, I would say first off, um, something that was really convicting to me during this time of quarantine that my dad was like really adamant about, we were all quarantined together in this house, um, even so much so that he like actually altered the the words of the prayer spiritual communion that we would say at the end of mass, which is to, to first and foremost go in with the like the posture um, 
that Jesus is already, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, right? You are a living temple of God that Jesus doesn't, as a baptized person, he doesn't come inside you and then leave you, right? And I've always like kind of just, I, I know that's not true, but I always kind of like think of it like that. Um, but that he's already like as close to you as he can get, right? He lives in you. So we would, we would actually pray the prayer of spiritual communion and say, um, I, what's the line? Like, I thank you because, um, or I welcome you as if you're already there. That's the thing. But we change it to, I wel- or I welcome you because you are already here. You know, that Jesus already lives in us. And so, um, to obvi- of course, as we, as we go back into Mass, Jesus has been preparing us to feed us again in a particular way um, through his body and his blood. Um, but, it's, but it's not as, as if he's been depriving us of, of him. And so I think for me, when I go back to Mass, that changes kind of, my perspective of Jesus is already in me. He's as close as he can get. And he wants to feed me in a particular way through the sacrament. Um, and so I would say, I, I mean, obviously like for, for me, before I received Jesus for the first time, I didn't get to go to like confession or anything. And so I just made sure to do, um, I, I did a very thorough examination of conscience and then prayed the act of contrition. Um, and so that was very helpful for me. That's something that I suggest, not of a, out of a place of fear of being like, oh my gosh, like, am I ready? Like, I'm so sorry, Jesus. Like, I'm so dirty. Like, don't look at me, you know, like, but, but just have a place of like, okay, like I want, I want to be in the right posture to receive you. And so to just do that, but with the intention of Jesus, anything um, that has built up in any like kind of spiritual gut that's built up in me that would hinder you from feeding me spiritually in the exact way that you want to through the reception of your body and blood just clear that away and then just like let go and just let this bask in the joy of being able to be with him again in that particular way I would say like that's been most helpful for me is just to to pray that to pray the act of condition to examine my conscience to ask the Lord to clear out anything and trust that he knows I'm genuine and then trust him right that he's gonna do it you know that he cleared out and he's gonna make me ready and not in a way that's like Oh, whatever, like it'll just be good. But to, to not be overly scrupulous about kind of making sure everything is right. But I think he really wants us to come back to his table with jubilation and with immense, immense joy. Um, as get, as just getting to come back and not out of, not in fear and not in kind of clenching and making sure that we've got everything lined up correctly so that he can come in here. He's already here. He just wants to, he wants to feed you. You know, so um, pray, pray whatever prayers you feel called to pray, examination of conscience, ask them to clear and just let it go and be joyful. Great answer. Anything to add, Jenny, that you want to add in there as a closing thought for that? Sure. Um, I didn't do this, so it's a recommendation. <laughs> um, arrive early because... Mm. At least here, I mean, it's a little, it's like, thank God, you know, we're back. <laughs> like, thank God we're back, like, in mass. But it's also social distance, and there's also people with masks on, and you're not encouraged to sing, and, like, all these things mm-hmm. can be kind of distracting a little bit, like, from entering back in. And so just being able to have 10 minutes, you know, before mass to have more of that stillness with the Lord and more of that calm um, or even just to have that as a transition point. So you can really like enter in well um, once mass begins. But I think um, something that just came to me um, was just like expressing to Jesus, like your desire, like kind of getting back to Rachel saying like, ex- like when communion, like when um, through the Eucharistic prayer and, through receiving Jesus and then sitting, you know, with the Lord afterwards is just like talking to Jesus of just being honest. Like, what has this time been like? You know, how has it been challenging for you? Like, what are the feelings that you have? Like the desperation you have, um, just kind of calling that to mind and just speaking to Jesus and just thanking him, you know, for being able to like receive him again. And just to really, I don't know, take in, take that time of reception. I know it's odd as well, like taking off the mask <laughs> and like receiving the Lord. Um, so they're trying to, it is just such an odd re-entry um, with mask wearing, but 
for me it was at least um but to really like, try to take that time or maybe it's even after mass like I had to do that last time like can we just like sit for like five minutes and just be so I can collect my thoughts and um just to talk to Jesus about where my heart is with him and in praise and thanksgiving to be able to receive him again physically mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I thank you so much, both of you for coming on and Marianne for being my co-host. Um, it's been a wonderful evening. I just have a couple closing thoughts um, about things coming up. So our next ID National is August 6th and it's going to the exact same format as this. Um, there's no one in July because our Americans have July 4th usually and it's a big old party. <laughs> so they like to skip July. Um, <laughs> Um, and then um, so that's the next one is August 6th and then also we still put on uh, the Pure Life team here in Canada put on Pure Life gatherings every Friday night Um, the topic this Friday is the Battle of Prayer you watch a short video by uh, Father Michael Schmitz and then the guest this is this Friday is Father David Butler and the host is Caitlin Matheson with Carly Whalen as a co-host and a praise and worship led by them too. So if you guys want to tune into something else, you can all go there. A um, few other notes. We have a YouTube channel now or Family Foundations Institute, our kind of parent has a YouTube channel and we have our ID London lives and ID stuff posted there. So you are welcome to go there. You can actually just like Google on YouTube or search on YouTube, ID London Live, and we pop right up. So I just did it to make sure it works, and it does. So that's fun. And then the next last, uh, one of the last things I have to say is we have a games night coming up this Monday. So anyone that wants to join, we're having an ID games night. So if anyone wants to play games with us, with the core team, and anyone that wants to join just as a way to get together when we can't get together, um, that's coming up. And lastly, in September, we are still planning our Canadian ID Summit. We're not sure how it's going to happen or what we're allowed to do. So we're figuring it out. But keep in mind that September 18th to 20th, that is still going to happen, whether it's an online format like this. Um, we're not exactly sure, but we're still planning it. So keep that in your calendars and keep that in mind. So again, I'd like to thank Jenny and Rachel and Mariana. I don't know if you guys have any closing thoughts you want to leave everyone. Um, feel free to shout them out now before we before we sign off for the night. I don't know if you guys have anything you want to say. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. This has been wonderful. Does anyone want to lead us in closing prayer? I think it was Jenny, right? Do you want to lead us in yeah. closing yeah. prayer? Cool. In the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come, Lord God, mighty God, Prince of Peace, come. We invite you into our hearts, into our minds. Unleash the power of the Spirit within us. We are desperate for you. We long for you. We long to be close to you. We just thank I thank you, Lord, that you are with us. That no matter where we are, you never leave us that all of our lives are known to you. We are not forgotten. We thank you, God, for this time tonight. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for just the joy of the spirit, the joy of eternity, the joy of being in relationship with you. I pray that all of us can come to you, to be with you, to sit with you, to learn from you, to be students of the word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, God the Father, we praise you. Anoint us in the power of your spirit and the joy of your spirit. Help us to live more and more as authentic disciples of Jesus Christ. Give us the courage that we need to root out sin in our life. Give us the courage, Lord Jesus. We need courage. We need boldness. We need your grace. We need your grace to grow in virtue, Lord. For we, (laughs) how are we able to do things without you, God? We are desperate for more. We need you, Lord, to grow in us, to move in us. Help us always to be faithful to you, no matter what falls in front of us. No matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, help us always to pursue you and to be faithful to you because you are always faithful to us. 
We thank you, God, for this time. I just pray that you send a fire in London. I pray that you send the Holy Spirit to captivate all their hearts and to renew them in your word and in your truth. They can become on fire with your word and be able to spread your goodness and your life to all that they encounter. We thank you, God. We praise you. Bless us, God. Bless us in your goodness. We praise you and we love you and we adore you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you all. That's it. So we have made it through the evening. Again, thanks, Jenny, Rachel, and Mariana for being on with us. And I think we're going to sign off. So we'll see you all later and see you at the next one. All right. Bye. Bye.